Hi, I'm Shuchi Rogers. I work at Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And today I'll be talking to you about ultrasound of the fallopian tube. I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. Today in this talk, I will be describing the imaging appearance of the normal and abnormal fallopian tube. I will review tubal occlusion devices and complications. I will describe different sonosalpingogram techniques, also known as HICOSI, and we will list mimickers and imaging pitfalls of the fallopian tube. So I wanted to first discuss the normal fallopian tube. The normal tube is approximately 8 to 10 centimeters long and is comprised of four anatomic segments, which course from proximal to distal, beginning with the interstitial, the isthmic, and then the ampullary and infundibular portions of the tube. So here is a diagram of the fallopian tube, and it shows you the interstitial portion, followed by the isthmus, the ampulla, and then the infundibulum widens out, where there are 25 fimbria at the end, and the fimbria are located adjacent to the ovary. And if you look here on this side, you can see that there is a mesosalpinx that envelops the fallopian tube and also covers the ovary. This is an intraoperative picture of a normal fallopian tube. Here is the uterus. This is the fallopian tube. This is the ovary. This is a vein. And what we have here is the mesosalpinx. I was taught that the normal fallopian tube is only visible on ultrasound when it is surrounded by fluid. So here, in this patient who has complex free fluid in the pelvis from a perforated appendicitis, we see the fallopian tube and the fimbriated portions, which look like finger-like projections, uh, outlined by some complex free fluid from a perforated appendicitis. However, with the higher resolution imaging, I believe that we are seeing more and more normal fallopian tubes, even without free fluid. And this is a patient who is a postmenopausal woman, and we can see a normal fallopian tube adjacent to the ovary with the fimbriated portion distally here, and there is no free fluid. So now on all my routine female pelvic ultrasounds, I'm always looking for the fallopian tubes, and particularly the fimbriated portion. This is a hysterosalpingogram, and it shows a normal fallopian tube. So this very narrow uh, portion adjacent to the uterus represents the interstitial or intramuscular segment of the fallopian tube. This is followed by the very narrow isthmic portion. Below here, the fallopian tube lumen widens slightly, and uh, this represents the ampullary portion of the tube. And if you notice that there are some filling defects within the tube, and these represent endosalpingeal folds, which serve to transport the ovum from the ovary to the uterus. And then lastly, we see here the free intraperitoneal spill of contrast in this patent fallopian tube. Fallopian tubes are also visualized on CT when there is a large amount of ascites within the pelvis. And here in this image, we see a normal fallopian tube, and here is a normal ovary posterior to it. This is a coronal view showing you the normal fallopian tube, and here we can again see the fimbriated portion. The abnormal fallopian tube occurs when there is pelvic inflammatory disease, endometriosis, torsion, ectopic pregnancy, and it is also affected by a variety of masses which can be malignant or benign. The most common disease to affect the fallopian tube is pelvic inflammatory disease. There are several signs that have been described to differentiate an abnormal fallopian tube from a cystic adnexal mass. These signs include the incomplete septa sign, cogwheel sign, beads on a string sign, tubular structure with a waist sign, and I'll be describing these signs in more detail. So firstly, the incomplete septa sign is a marker of both acute and chronic tubal disease. Here we have an ovoid fluid-filled tubular structure with a linear echogenic protrusion arising from one wall but not reaching the opposite. 
While this can be a marker of the fallopian tube, the pitfall is that it can be visualized in cystic ovarian neoplasms. The cogwheel sign is a marker of acute tubal pathology and it represents a thickened tubal wall and thickened endosalpingeal folds as demarcated by the arrow. Um, here we have a histology specimen showing you a thickened tubal wall and here we have some thickened endosalpingeal folds. The beads on a string sign correlates with chronic tubal disease and on this ultrasound image, this is a transverse view of a dilated fluid-filled fallopian tube and we have mural echogenic nodules that represent the atrophic residual endosalpingeal folds. And this is a useful sign to differentiate from papillary projections in a serous ovarian tumor. Lastly, the waist sign is when you have a tubular cystic structure with diametrically opposed indentations along both sides. And when combined with a tubular shape, the likelihood ratio of a hydrosalpinx is extremely high. It, in one study performed by Dr. Patel, it was found in 12 out of 26 hydrosalpinges and no other masses. So the problem is, though, that it's not sensitive, but it is very specific. Now on to pelvic inflammatory disease. So this occurs when an ascending infection of the lower genital tract infects the cervix, endometrium, fallopian tubes, and, the, and then sometimes the ovaries and the peritoneal cavity. It is an enormous cost to society because of infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and pain. The abnormal fallopian tube is considered the hallmark of PID. And there is a spectrum of disease that progresses from an acute salpingitis, which means that the fallopian tube is thickened with minimal, if any, interluminal fluid, to a pyosalpinx when the tube obstructs and the pus accumulates and distends the tube lumen, or a hydrosalpinx, in which case the pus resolves but the tube remains occluded and fluid accumulates. The abnormal tube may involve the adjacent ovary and form a tubo-ovarian complex, but if left untreated, it can form a tubo-ovarian abscess. So this is an example of an acute salpingitis. We have the thickened hypervascular infundibular portion of the fallopian tube and the arrows show the fimbriated portion of the tube. There is no interluminal fluid, and the color Doppler image demonstrates increased vascularity. And I have here a normal tube for comparison purpose. So on this slide, we have a pyosalpinx and tubo ovarian complex. This is a transverse view of the distended fallopian tube containing pus, and we have the uh, residual endosalpingeal folds on the side. And then this is the tube in the sagittal plane. On the other side, this is a color Doppler imaging, image demonstrating the hypervascularity surrounding the pyosalpinx, and this is adherent to the adjacent ovary. These are follicles in the ovary, and this represents a tubo ovarian complex. When left unchecked, the Tubal ovarian abscess occurs and you get a large collection of pus with loss of normal tube ovarian architecture. As CT is being ordered with increasing frequency to evaluate for nonspecific abdominal pain, it is important to recognize the subtle findings of PID. So fat haziness, complex fluid within the cul-de-sac, peritoneal enhancement are depicted here. More anteriorly, we have thickened enhancing fallopian tubes without interluminal pus, representing a salpingitis. And then we also have bilateral edematous ovaries, which would appear as polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. MRI is not the first line imaging test to evaluate for PID, but occasionally MRI is ordered when there is a complex adnexal mass and a confusing clinical setting. So I wanted to highlight a few features of PID. These, are, these top two images are T1-weighted images. While pyosalpinx and tubo ovarian abscesses are predominantly hypointense on T1-weighted images, 
they can be increased in signal intensity on T1 weighted images based on the amount of protein content or hemorrhage within the abscess or pyosalpinx. So here, the left-sided tubo ovarian abscess does contain proteinaceous material. This is a T1 post-contrast image and it shows marked intense enhancement throughout the, the uh, pelvis and you could see all of this inflammatory stranding and that's very characteristic for acute PID. So we have bilateral tubo ovarian abscess, a portion of a pyosalpinx. And on T2 weighted images, we have a fluid debris level within the abscess that's on the right side. I wanted to also talk briefly about hydrosalpinges visible on hysterosalpingogram. So this is uh, the normal endometrial cavity, and here we have a normal interstitial and isthmic portion of the tube, and then we have a dilated ampullary segment of the tube. In my experience, I have found that there is often an asymmetric dilatation of the fallopian tube, and that the ampullary segment often tends to dilate more and can sometimes balloon out and mimic a cystic ovarian mass. I also wanted to point out this small filling defect within this tube that represents a residual endosalpingeal fold. And then here on this side, you can see as the tube distends, it will fold upon itself and form that incomplete septa sign. So moving on now to other disease processes. This is a 29-year-old female with chronic pelvic pain. And here we have transvaginal images demonstrating a tubular structure filled with fine low-level internal echoes. And on the left, we have a waste sign. And on the right, we have an incomplete septa sign. And this patient had hematosalpings from an intraluminal endometriosis. This is a patient who also had chronic pelvic pain. And we have a tubular structure with a waste sign and an incomplete septa sign filled with fine low-level internal echoes. Here we have an adjacent ovary. This is a corresponding T1-weighted fat-suppressed image showing marked increased signal intensity of the contents representing a hematosalpinx. This patient had endometriosis, and then she also had a small ovarian endometrioma. Fallopian tube endometriosis is typically divided into two types. The endometrial implants on the peritoneal surface or serosa of the tube, these are often not visible on imaging. There are also intraluminal implants on the tubal mucosa. Obstructing lesions can cause hydrosalpinx, and intraluminal implants may appear as a hematosalpinx after repeat cyclical hemorrhage. This is a patient who came in. She had acute onset of pelvic pain and a history of a remote tubal ligation. Her findings were nonspecific on physical exams, so she was she underwent a CT stone search as the initial radiologic workup. We have a tubular structure in the right lower quadrant. This is an axial, this is a sagittal image. Here we have a, a liver window image and it's showing some of the area of the vascular pedicle. This patient uh, went on to get an, an ultrasound to further characterize the cystic lesion. On ultrasound, we have a tubular structure with an incomplete septa sign, and we were very worried about a torsed fallopian tube based on the history of acute onset pelvic pain and the remote tubal ligation. She went to the operating room, and they found a torsed necrotic fallopian tube. And I also want to point out that this area of hyperdensity on the CT scan corresponded to thrombosed vessels in the pedicle supplying the fallopian tube. You can see it here as a hemorrhagic region within the pelvis. And I also just want to point out, again, this contrast with the normal intraoperative photo of the fallopian tube. Here's the normal, and here's that torsed other fallopian tube. So fallopian tube torsion, it's pretty rare, and especially an isolated fallopian tube torsion. Often, you will have an adnexal torsion, which involves 
both the fallopian tube and the ovary. Risk factors for torsion include tubal ligation, a long mesosalpinx, a large hydatid cyst of mergagni measuring more than 4 or 5 centimeters, and a hydrosalpinx. It most commonly affects adolescent girls and premenopausal women. The right fallopian tube is involved more than the left because of fixation of the left by sigmoid colon and mesentery. The symptoms include acute onset of pelvic pain, nausea, and vomiting. And on imaging, it can be variable. The, the tubal wall may be thickened, and it may contain internal debris. And you may see the twisting of the tube and the vessels. Now moving on to ectopic pregnancy. Here we have a case of a classic tubal ectopic pregnancy where we have an adnexal mass completely separate from the ovary and there is no intrauterine pregnancy. Here there's the gestational sac with the yolk sac within the adnexal mass. Here we have a sine loop which will allow us to follow the interstitial part of the fallopian tube out to the isthmic ampullary part to where the ectopic is. So I'm going to play the sine loop again and we could follow out. Here is the interstitial part going to the isthmic ampullary. Boom, there's the ectopic. I find sine loops extremely helpful to confirm the tubal location of these ectopic pregnancies. The vast majority of these ectopic pregnancies are in the ampullary, infundibular, or isthmic portion of the fallopian tube. And fortunately, only a small subset are in the interstitial segment. And why is that important to know if it is in that segment? Because of life-threatening hemorrhage from intramyometrial arcuate vasculature if unrecognized. The coronal 2D and 3D reformatted imaging aids in diagnosis. Here we have a different case. This is a patient who was pregnant. She had a transvaginal ultrasound. It shows no intrauterine pregnancy. But then we go towards the left side, and then we have a sac-like structure with some bulging of the myometrium. Transabdominal images show no intrauterine gestational sac, but then we have the endometrium connecting to this gestational sac towards the uterine fundus. Here, this is a transverse transabdominal image showing you bulging of the left side of the uterus. This is a left interstitial ectopic pregnancy. This is that same patient. We, we made a coronal 2D image of that ectopic pregnancy, and now there's no question that that is an ectopic pregnancy. And this is the intraoperative photo showing you that ectopic, and you can see the increased vascularity surrounding the ectopic pregnancy. So this is a coronal 2D image of the interstitial ectopic pregnancy juxtaposed with a, a patient who was not pregnant just to show how this pregnancy occurs. So here the hypoechoic line corresponds to the interstitial segment of the fallopian tube. The blastocyst courses through this segment and then implants in the myometrium and then the pregnancy grows and grows and if left unchecked it ruptures and can lead to Ex, uh, exsanguination and patient death. So let me talk about some of the signs that are useful to diagnose the interstitial tubal ectopic pregnancy. This is, these include an empty endometrial canal, the interstitial line sign where the echogenic line from the endometrium leads to the interstitial gestational sac, and the myometrial mantle where the myometrium surrounds the gestational sac, and the bulging sign, where we have an abnormal bulging of the uterine contour from the ectopic pregnancy in the interstitial part of the uterine fundus. Moving on to fallopian tube masses. Benign masses, most commonly a hydatid cyst of morgagni or a paratubal cyst, but there are also leiomyomas, fibromas, and mucosal polyps, and malignant masses. So let's start with this. This is a, a patient who had an indeterminate left adnexal mass, history of breast cancer. The patient was very worried. She underwent an ultrasound, and it shows that there's a simple cyst. But we're scrutinizing these images for fimbria, and there we go. We see it. It's arising from the fimbriated portion of the fallopian tube and represents a simple paratubal cyst or a hydatid cyst of mergagni.
These arise from the paramesonephric ducts and it's cystic dilatation of one of the fimbria. So now whenever I'm looking at these sine loops on my female pelvic ultrasound cases, if I see a small paratubal cyst, I automatically look for the fimbria because often I will be able to make a very specific diagnosis if I can see that it's associated with the fimbria. This is a different patient. She's a postmenopausal patient with pelvic pain. She has a echogenic, solid, irregularly marginated mass in the right adnexa. And this represents a primary fallopian tube carcinoma. Here, these arrows point to a hydrosalpinx that was associated with the mass. And the color and spectral Doppler image demonstrates low resistance flow with an RI of 0.4, which is abnormal for a postmenopausal patient. So if we look here, uh, this patient also underwent an MRI of her pelvis to further characterize, and the yellow arrows are pointing to an intermediate and signal intensity mass that's intimate with the right hydrosalpinx. The mass demonstrated increased signal intensity on high B-value diffusion-weighted images and was dark on the ADC map, so it restricts diffusion. Here we have that hydrosalpinx outlined by the blue arrows, and we were able to demonstrate that the right ovary was separate from the mass. Primary fallopian tube carcinoma most commonly occurs in postmenopausal women, and it is a rare malignancy felt to represent approximately 1% of gynecologic malignancy. There is increased incidence of primary fallopian tube carcinoma in site 2 in BRCA1 and 2 patients. These patients undergo prophylactic salpingo oophorectomy, and up to 17% of these patients have these small tumors. The prevalence of PFTC may be underestimated due to difficulty differentiating from an epithelial ovarian cancer. And there is an emerging theory that ovarian high-grade serous adenocarcinoma may actually arise from a fallopian tube. So the fallopian tube tumor may implant in the ovary at which time the tumor explodes and results in this high-grade adenocarcinoma. The most common histology is a papillary serous adenocarcinoma. These tumors usually originate in the ampulla and can be bilateral in 20% of patients. On imaging, it is often mistaken for an exophytic fibroid or a solid ovarian mass. And what's interesting about this tumor is that it produces excessive serous fluid and leading to a hydrosalpinx and tubal distension. But these fallopian tubes are not obstructed. So what happens is the tube will distend, it will cause intermittent pelvic pain, and then the tube will release its contents either within the peritoneal cavity or into the vagina. Moving on to fallopian tube occlusion devices, these devices are placed into the fallopian tubes to prevent pregnancy. These devices can have complications including perforation or migration, and the use of ultrasound is to verify the correct position with 2D, 3D coronal imaging, and also to locate a lost or misplaced device. This x-ray on the left shows bilateral tubal occlusion devices and a corresponding ultrasound image in the coronal plane shows satisfactory position of the device in the interstitial portion of the fallopian tube. This is a different patient. We have one eShore device on this lateral CT scout and that same device on the frontal. Here we have a sagittal 3D image and it's showing malpositioned eShore device within the fundal myometrium. This is a patient who underwent an HSG to determine if the fallopian tubes are occluded. An HSG is performed after three months to make sure that the patient can use the eShore device as a form of birth control. So here we have contrast opacifying the endometrial canal. There's no 
leakage of contrast beyond the device on the right, but we do have leakage of contrast on the left, so this tube is still patent. Bonus finding. We have an indentation on the endometrial contour representing a submucosal fibroid, and then we have these little outpouchings and wispiness of the contrast here representing adenomyosis. The next topic is sonosalpingogram, or hysterosalpingo contrast sonography, HICOSI. And this is a very exciting area of ultrasound. And this is a technique to assess tubal patency utilizing air, saline, agitated saline, or echo enhancing fluid, or color and power Doppler. I wrote may, but I think it should replace hysterosalpingogram and laparoscopy with chromoperturbation as a way to assess the fallopian tubes. And the technique is catheterizing the cervix with a sonohysterography catheter, orient the transvaginal probe so that both the utera uterine cornu and the ovary are visible, inject small amounts of air and follow the course through one fallopian tube at a time, and or an indirect sign of assessing that at least one tube is patent is to inject saline and assess for new or increasing fluid in the cul-de-sac. So this is a patient who had a sagittal image of her cul-de-sac obtained showing no free fluid. She underwent her sonohysterogram and post sonohysterogram we have new free fluid within the cul-de-sac. These are images utilizing color Doppler to assess the interstitial aspect of the fallopian tube. Here we have uh, color Doppler jet in the expected region of the left cornu. But you can see here that if this is limited by flash artifacts and we're unable to follow the course of the entire fallopian tube. So this is not a very useful technique. Here this shows a color Doppler jet of the interstitial portion of the tube on a different patient. This is a different patient who had a sonosalpingogram with agitated saline and we can see increased echogenicity representing air within the endometrial cavity and also a small amount of air within the adjacent right fallopian tube. And this next video clip show, is going to show you the air moving in real time in the endometrial cavity as well as the right fallopian tube. So you can see that. This is a patient who had infertility and a history of a right hydrosalpinx. These are images of her left adnexa. We have the ovary and then an echogenic structure adjacent to the ovary and the echogenic structure is tubular in shape on the sagittal image. Sonohysterography was performed and it resulted in distension of this tubular structure representing a hydrosalpinx. Now lastly, I'll be talking about mimickers and pitfalls of the fallopian tube and I'll be discussing several of these different diagnoses listed here. This is a 43-year-old female with right lower quadrant pain. This is one of the defining cases for me. Uh, I was signing out the resident after a night of call, and we were trying to figure out, does this patient have increased enhancement of the appendix, and is there an early appendicitis? Or possibly, does this patient have an enlarged right ovary and a hemorrhagic right ovarian cyst? as the cause for the pain. So we gave a differential. The patient underwent an ultrasound, and these, this is a sagittal view of the right adnexa, and it shows a thickened fallopian tube, and posteriorly, a mildly enlarged ovary with the polycystic appearance. So here is a corresponding contrast-enhanced CT, the sagittal view showing you a thickened fallopian tube representing a salpingitis and the oophoritis. So this patient actually had PID. So in retrospect, if we go back to that image, if we look here, this 
enhancing structure represents that thickened right fallopian tube. Here is that edematous ovary, and you can see it's more hypodense than the left ovary. And then the arrow is pointing to thickened right uterosacral ligaments. So after this case, whenever I see a, a woman with abdominal pain, I always think about the possibility of PID. Ultrasound versus CT for PID. Ultrasound is more specific in differentiating ovarian from tubal pathology. The actual act of transvaginal ultrasound also aids in the diagnosis, and it's useful to differentiate tubal ovarian complex from a tubal ovarian abscess. On CT, mild inflammatory changes are better appreciated. The extent of a ruptured tubal ovarian abscess is better delineated, and it's also best for imaging ancillary findings such as small bowel ileus, um, or hydroureter. Moving on to a different patient. We have a cystic structure that's somewhat tubular in shape within the pelvis. Put the color Doppler on, and this represents pelvic varices. Here we have a complex cystic structure with multiple septations. There's no waste sign, no incomplete septa sign, and this represents a cystic ovarian neoplasm. This ultrasound image shows a cystic structure within the pelvis, and we have an ovary in the periphery, and this represents a peritoneal inclusion cyst. An MRI was performed for characterization of the septation that was within the cyst. And here on this T2-weighted image, we can see the ovary in the periphery. Here's the follicle. And then here we have this little nodular area. If we look at that nodular area more carefully, we can see that there is actually little finger-like projections, the fimbria. This patient got intravenous contrast, and what else do we see? We see a tiny little t cyst arising from the fimbriated portion of this of this structure. So this is actually a tiny paratubal cyst in the fimbriated portion of the fallopian tube, and there's no suspicious mass within this peritoneal inclusion cyst. In my experience, fallopian tubes are often involved and adhesed in various different locations within peritoneal inclusion cysts, and in this cine loop you will see there's a ovary on one side, and then we have these fallopian tubes that are in bizarre places within this peritoneal inclusion cyst. So there's one ov ovary fallopian tube, another fallopian tube over here. And these fallopian tubes are not to be mistaken for solid masses. So here's a problem scenario. This is a patient who comes in with a positive pregnancy test. There's no IUP in the ultra, there's no IUP. We have a left fallopian tube. It looks a little bit thick. Is it normal or abnormal? This patient ended up not getting a follow-up at our institution. There was no hypervascularity on color Doppler. I think we should be looking for fallopian tubes all the time on all patients and not just in the setting of a positive pregnancy test. This way we can kind of get a sense of what the normal is and not get freaked out when we're faced with a fallopian tube and no IUP. This is a patient who came in with abdominal pain. We have a tubular cystic structure within the pelvis didn't have any flow on color Doppler. More distally, there was an echogenic calculus within it, and this was a hydroureter secondary to a ureteral stone. This is my last case. This is a 21-year-old female with pelvic pain and fever. We have complex fluid within the cul-de-sac, complex fluid anterior to the uterus, as well as in Morrison's pouch. We rendered a diagnosis of ruptured tubal ovarian abscess secondary to PID. But if we look at these images more carefully, in the right adnexa, we can see normal fallopian tube architecture.
but it's surrounded by pus. In the left, we have normal fallopian tube architecture and an adherent ovary surrounded by pus. So this doesn't make sense. The, and that's because the actual diagnosis was a perforated appendicitis. So pitfall, pus from perforated appendicitis and ruptured tubo ovarian abscess appear similar. Look for preserved fallopian tube and ovarian architecture in order to differentiate between the two. Take home points. Look for the fallopian tube during routine pelvic ultrasound. Scrutinize the sine clips for fimbria, paratubal cysts. Recognize findings that distinguish a thickened or dilated fallopian tube from other cystic agnexal masses. Tubular shape with the beads on a string and a waist sign are most helpful. The incomplete septa sign is not specific for hydrosalpinx. Echoes within the fallopian tube consider pio or hematosalpinx. 3D ultrasound is useful for tubal occlusion devices and pregnancy implantation. Primary fallopian tube carcinoma is a difficult prospective diagnosis and consider making this diagnosis in the setting of hydrosalpinx and a solid intraluminal mass. Ultrasound is more specific than CT in differentiating tubal from ovarian pathology. Sonosalpingogram or hycosy Utilize agitated saline or air bubbles to visualize portions of the fallopian tube. New or increasing fluid in the cul-de-sac indicates patency of at least one of the fallopian tubes. Thank you.